Welcome, welcome all to the Church of Perpetual Life. I'm so glad that you are here. Thank those of you who have braved the uh, highways that are packed with cars and have come in time for the beginning. I know that some others are going to be coming afterwards and they're going to miss all the fun stuff at the beginning. But I also want to welcome everyone who's coming to us live streaming and, and joining our live stream now. How's it going back there, Doug? All set? All right. So. My name is Neil Vandry, and I'm your officiator here this evening, and I just have a few things to go over before we get right underway. The first thing I'd like to do is uh, recognize everyone here who's here for the first time. Who's here for the first time? <laughs> Most everyone. Wonderful. So we have a lot of first-timers. And who's here for not the first time? Just so I can visually have it. So it's about 50-50, okay. So it's about 50-50. You may have noticed that we have a new survey form for those of you who are coming the second time or repeat times. And uh, for those of you coming the first time, you wouldn't know that that's the same form we've been using for three years or since uh, the beginning of the church. This church was established in 2013. Our first service was November. And since then, we've been having services typically every month. And our services are transhumanist style services. These are services for the Church of Perpetual Life. So this church is a science-based church, the only one in the world like it. We have calls from people in Colorado and Chicago and San Francisco and New York and people all around the world. They want to see another Church of Perpetual Life. And so what we have done is we have live stream. We've arranged live streaming for every service. So people all over the world are watching us right now and they're going to listen to the presentations here and some of them may even call in during the question and answers and be able to have their questions answered while they're watching in Moscow or London or Buenos Aires or wherever they are. So we are forming satellite churches of perpetual life virtually around the globe and that's our, our next step. Meanwhile, here we are meeting in person rather than uh, being on Facebook or watching the live stream, and it's wonderful to be here in person. Uh, there's great snacks and conversations beforehand, and afterwards there's more conversation that's great, and so it's, it's important to be meeting in person and, and doing this, and this is what church, the Church of Perpetual Life is all about. That's what we're doing here today. I would like to make a, an announcement uh, that's a little bit uh, jumping the gun. Alex? Would you like to come up and say, just wave to everybody, or come on forward? A, a new director of the church, uh, Alex Vidal, you've known him, you've seen him. He's been serving as the president of the Board of Trustees, and he has stepped down in order to take this position as director. So, uh, say hello. Good evening. <laughs> so this is Alex, and so he's a director, and he's uh, got a number of multitasks that he's going to be doing, everything from tech-savvy stuff that I don't ex exactly know what he's talking about most of the time to, uh, to, to meeting some of you young folks and, and getting to know you better. So he's here for that purpose, and I hope that you get the chance to talk with him after all of the events tonight. Let's give a great applause to our new director, Alex Vidal. <laughs> Welcome. <coughs> also here tonight, I, I would be remiss if I didn't introduce a dear friend of mine, Karen. Karen, would you stand? Karen is here, and I wish that she lived here. I wish she lived across the street and was here all the time. <laughs> Karen, you'll get to know her better also after, after the events, but uh, she's uh, been an inspiration to me from the very day that I met her with Ben Best at a special meetup that was north of here. And I, uh, as I told you, Karen, you've uh, inspired me, and uh, I've thought about many of the things you've said. And thank you for being here tonight as well. Since you're here, mo many of you, half of you, for the first time, I'd like to point out a couple of amenities for at Perpetual Life. Uh, one of them is that we have a library. There's a library in the outer sanctuary. It's a bookcase there with uh, wonderful books, books you can't find anywhere, but you are allowed to borrow them. If you're here for the weekend, feel free to borrow them through Sunday. If, you're, if you live in South Florida, feel free to borrow them, take them with, away with you, read them, and bring them back next month. We are going to have a presentation next month uh, next month will be Rich. Where are you, Richard? Richard is still downstairs. He'll be coming up shortly. You may have noticed we have a TV downstairs, so we are live streaming to the TV downstairs. Uh, at some point in the future, we'll technically figure out how to get a cable down there and just <laughs> pipe it in. But it's a, it's a good uh, thing to have a live stream to make sure when the li if there's any problem with the live stream, everybody downstairs comes up and says, Doug, 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 something's wrong. Usually it's just somebody unplugged the TV, but... 
The, uh, so, so that's there for a purpose, and the, the purpose is that uh, we can just fit so many people upstairs, and so now we have overflow downstairs. Anyway, Rich, uh, Rich Daly and his wife Beth, they uh, come here from Naples every month. Every time we have something going on, they do the three or three and a half hour round trip drive from Naples over here and back again. Tonight they'll be leaving for Naples. So they're very committed and we're very happy to be bringing our Richard on board as a director. For those of you who are members, I want to note that we are going to be having our annual elections, or our regular elections, not annual, but our regular elections and regular meeting next month in June. And uh, the roster is uh, Greg Strom for president, uh, Bill Falloon for vice president, I hope. Thank you. And also Ben Best for secretary treasurer and our new director, Richard, uh, who's from Naples. He'll, he'll be our, uh, our director there. And I'll, I'll maintain and stay on as your officiator. Perpetually, I hope. <laughs> so that's what we'll be doing next month. We'll be having official votes. But this is a time, and those of you members are, who are live streaming and, and see this, note that if you have an interest in being an alternate or on the board or, for fill, or filling any of these positions, please let me know today, tonight, by email over this pa next week so that we can uh, note that. We are looking for an alternate. That is someone who would be on the board and could then fill a spot if something should happen in the future. We're also happy to note that we are going to be uh, hopefully opening a spot for a younger member, a, a youth member on the board, and we have a couple of people interested in that position. So if any of you younger uh, potential members and members of the church would like to be in that advisory youth council role, we'd, I'd be very interested in hearing about that. And there's Richard Daly now. Richard, I don't know if you heard, but I announced that you're going to be Good, you heard downstairs? So it's working. That's good to know. <laughs> great, great, great. So, um, so that's what we're doing on that. So that's about all the housekeeping I have on this. Uh, oh yes, Ford, 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 where are you? Why don't you come on up, Ford? You may have noticed there's another cameraman in the building and he is Ford Fisher, a producer, director, independent filmmaker who is filming tonight. He's gonna make you all famous. And uh, I, I think I'm going to turn the microphone over to you in just a moment, I think. If you, okay, great. So Ford's going to tell you a little bit about what he's doing. We're going to give him four and a half minutes. And uh, two of those minutes are going to be filled with one of your films that we have that is going to be coming up. But tell him all about it, Ford. Right. So uh, I found out about transhumanism only about half a year ago. And instantly, I was sort of hooked on the topic. I found it uh, brilliantly interesting uh, and potentially sort of society changing in the future. Um, and also very underreported, right? So I studied at American University studying film and journalism, and so I know all about the inundation we get with politics and all sorts of other stories, and this is one that I've never heard in the media before. So I'm hoping to fill in that gap and sort of start telling the transhumanist uh, story uh, before people might otherwise hear about it. Uh, so I put together a little trailer, which uh, you'll see there, which is how I raised some money on Indiegogo. Um, I was actually sick when I did the voiceover for this trailer, so I don't sound too good in it. But um, I ended up raising a little bit of money uh, to travel around the country and uh, tell the story of the transhumanist movement. And so uh, tonight is a part of that. Great. So, yeah, give him a hand. Give him a hand. <laughs> young, man who's, young man who's out to change the world, and he's doing it. And what we're going to do is show a film here in just a moment. As soon as you're ready, Doug, you can you can let that film fly. We have one of your two films. We're going we're gonna to let one of those go. I guess he told you about that. And also, so you have the opportunity to be in a film. And he'll be able to uh, interview you. He's interested in talking to you. If you're interested in talking with him, let him know. He's here for that. Ready when you are, Doug? And in the meantime, let me just let you know that we have new flyers for the church, and I encourage all of you members to take a dozen or two dozen of these and bring them with you. Give these to your friends. Let them know that we're going to be meeting next month on the fourth Thursday in June. Come on over here and enjoy what we're, what we're all about here. So take a dozen or so of these and spread them around and, and give them to your best friends and your family. And let them, th this will explain what the Church of Perpetual Life is and why it's a church and where our faith is. Our faith is in science and technology to end and reverse aging and defy death. Here we go. Over the past day. Okay. 
So that was a very short film that, uh, <laughs> no, we've, we've got it coming. Okay. It's always the technical pauses that are the most fun in life, are they not? And here's something. I don't know what this is, but this looks uh, encouraging. Does this look good, Ford? Are we on the right channel? All right. Decade, computers have become more and more like humans. Talking to people is my primary function. Meanwhile, humans are becoming more like computers. If these developments make you excited for the future, you may be a transhumanist. Transhumanism is an international movement that aims to transform humanity by creating technologies that enhance human intellect and physical ability and even lifespan. In the extreme, they hope to overcome death itself. In 2014, Zoltan Istvan formed the Transhumanist Party to advocate his Transhumanist Bill of Rights and ran for president, traveling the country in his immortality bus. Istvan even had a computer chip injected into his hand. He uses it to open his house door and unlock his computer. In order to maintain the intrinsic value of life, you must be conscious to, uh, to have it, to believe in it, to, to know it. And so uh, in that respect, death is the worst thing that can ever happen to anyone. This movement could shape the future of humanity, yet the media have mostly ignored it until now. Would you evolve past human? Nicely done, Ford, and uh, keep up the good work. You might have noticed the man with the eye. He's doing an eye. Uh, basically, he was changing his eyeball. What happened was, uh, I believe, when he was young, he, he had an injury that made him blind in that eye, and he's done some interesting things. That Ford will tell you more about that. Uh, these are some amazing things that are happening. You saw the man with the robot arm. Well, he lost his arm, and now he has an arm back. It's incredible. It's incredible, the future of, uh, of our technology. The most incredible to me, of course, is the age reversal process. And that is something I, I hope that uh, somebody can talk about tonight a little bit about maybe even GDF 11 or parabiosis. Uh, parabiosis, Dr. Church from Harvard. You might want to Google that. Uh, GDF 11, another thing to Google. Two things that are on the right on the horizon. I noticed that we have Devere here. Welcome, Devere from Osiris, another startup uh, cryonics organization in South Florida. And you'll be able to meet with him afterwards, too. I hope you'll be able to stick around a little while, Devere, and his lovely wife. So I think it's time to get things underway. Rudy. You know, I've known Rudy from, for quite a while. I met him, I believe, I think I met you. The, even though he's from Florida, I had to go to Arizona to meet Rudy. I believe I met him in Laughlin at the first Adventurist conference there. And the man whose jacket was just charged up and ready for his talk a gentleman who has done a lot for cryonics. Uh, he's, he, he's, he's world famous in the cryonics industry. Everybody in cryonics knows him. I don't know anyone who's interested in cryonics that doesn't know Rudy. And uh, I think that's all I'll say about you for now, Rudy. Fair enough. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Neil. This is going to be fun. I feel like I've uh, worked about 40 years to be here at this moment not been working their presentation that long. Uh, but I really am genuinely excited to be here. And I'm also really pleased to have a wonderful extra group that I did not expect any of them to be able to be here, but they, they were, and they are. This, would you, if you're in the teens and 20s, would you stand up, please? We've got a group from literally all over the world of teens and 20s cryonicists who have come. Thank you, give, give them a hand, thank you. And uh, we're going to hang out with them this weekend. It's going to be terrific, and we're glad that Bill has brought them here. Uh, so if you guys will promise me that you'll give this as much energy and enthusiasm and focus and intensity as you possibly can, I promise to do that same thing. And we'll see if we can't get through some information here that really may be helpful and meaningful to you. Uh, I'm Rudy Hoffman. I happen to live in Daytona Beach, Florida, Port Orange area right now, about five hours north. Anybody know where Port Orange is? 
<clears throat> and anyway, the, uh, I'm delighted to come here to talk about something I think is very, very important and share these ideas in a way. And here's my aspirational goal. I want this to be as good as a TED Talk. And I talked with Bill about, I said, I want this thing to be as good as a TED Talk. And I, that's the aspirational goal. So that's, we're going to see if we can't do that in 10 or 15 minutes, cover a lot of very cr clear information in a clear, crisp, meaningful, memorable way. So obviously I'm here to talk about uh, Quranics. So let's start with this. The, uh, what is, here's the outline. What is Quranics? Here's what we're going to cover. Uh, what that is, the science supporting Quranics, the costs, obviously if it's, if, if it's the fa most fabulous thing in the world and nobody could afford it, it would be a moot point. And the acceler why the accelerating future that we are a part of supports this idea. Uh, by the way, back there in the back, how's our sound, how's our sound quality? Good, we're good. I'm going to start hollering your ear pretty soon. We're going to be, this is going to be the transhumanist televangelist session here. Uh, and we, let's start with this rather, uh, rather, uh, would you guys do a thought experiment with me? Let's say you're not in this remarkably great building we're here. Let's say that you're in this environment. I just got back from California a couple of days ago and I was in a train, in a plane. Didn't look quite this nice. In the real world, they're a lot more crowded. But you're in that plane, here it is. Picture yourself in the plane, you're crowded, you got these people jammed in next to you, and then you hear this big clunk, and you say, that can't be good. And then here's what happens. The captain comes on the speaker and says, well, there has been an explosion in the engine. Now to his credit, the guy is a pretty calm professional. He's, we sound, he says this in a nice, calm voice. The plane is gonna crash in 15 minutes. No chance of survival, is there is a potential way out. The plane happens to be transferring a shipment of parachutes, and you can have one if you want. I'm not going to read a PowerPoint, but the point being there is parachutes that are available. Now, they're untested. It's an experimental system. We don't know what the terrain's like down there. There's no guarantee this is going to work, but if you want one of these, you can have one. Or if you don't, you can simply stay in your seat. You cannot take any kind of proactive stance whatsoever and die when the plane goes down. The purpose of this thought exercise, and I'll go back for this in a minute, because I want you to really picture yourself in this. My, my mission here is take, all of us like to think we're rational human beings, and I like to think I'm a rational human being, but I, what I want to do in the few minutes we have together is talk not just to your extreme forebrain, your rational self. I also want to get to do something called getting into your emotional brain, where we actually make decisions and make think about, think about things. So all of a sudden, death maybe is not something that we hope is not going to happen soon. What if it's imminent? So let's take a minute and put yourself in this. People are panicking. They don't know what to do. What do you do? All of a sudden, death is going to be imminent. If you take some, some kind of proactive step, something good could happen. How many of us think we would take some kind of proactive step and grab one of those parachutes? Ooh, look at this crowd. This is a proactive crowd. Absolutely, let's do that. And it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out this obviously matter. You're going to be bamboozled with metaphors this evening because I believe in metaphor and allegory. Uh, Kranix is an experimental procedure. It is experimental. It's not proven, but it is legitimate and legitimate science that basically is designed to save you and your brain pattern. And I think that's potentially important. Any of us like ourselves? You can raise your hand. I like myself most of the time. Sometimes I'm annoyed with myself. Sometimes I'm disgusted with myself. But usually I like myself. I suspect most of us in this room like yourself. You like your partners. You like your friends. But your brain pattern, you, is precious. It's irreplaceable. It's a huge library. And we don't want to see a library burn. And we don't want to see your brain burn. We want to see it preserved. So let's see if there's this idea makes sense. This happens to be the Alcor facility. Alcor is a Quranics organization that's been around since 1972. It's a 501c3 tax qualified charity that basically is, along with the Quranics Institute, the main Quranics organizations in the world. Any of us been out to Alcor physically? Quite a few of us. Uh, Alcor is in Scottsdale, Arizona, suburb of Phoenix, Arizona. And we have a second organization. There's, there's the Alcor 
doers. You see those things? What those are? They're big. They're big like big thermos bottles that have liquid nitrogen in them. At uh, minus 196 degrees centigrade, basically biological activity simply stops. For all virtual purposes, it basically freezes time, biostasis, and basically designed to take you forward to a future technology that may be able to cure what you died of and cure the damage caused by the process themselves, itself, and ideally bring you back. And any technology that can bring us back, folks, is going to bring us back not as the old aged creature that maybe we went into the doer as, not with the problems that we have, but probably feeling as good as you've ever felt in your life. I like to feel good. You guys like to feel good? And I don't always feel good, quite honestly. That's annoying, but the part of the human condition is most of us don't feel good a good part of the time. As we age, we tend to feel less good a good part of the time. And but the, so the whole idea behind Quranics, one of the misconceptions is, hey, I don't want to come back as some kind of old geezer. The whole idea of Quranics is not that you come back as an old geezer. The whole idea of Quranics is you come back feeling the way you felt the very best day of your entire life. And I don't, because any technology that can indeed bring us back will also have figured out what type of neurochemistry will optimize us. And obviously, we're all a bag of chemicals. Some of, us, some of those chemicals work better than other for us, others for us. If those are optimizable, it would be nice to feel great. So that's the idea behind Quranics, is not that you come back as a, uh, in the way that you went in, but you come back feeling tremendous. This is the Quranics Institute in near Detroit, Michigan, a little town called Clinton Township, Michigan. Uh, the Quranics Institute also has doers. Those are a little different looking. And basically, there are human beings in here. And we don't call them, uh, uh, we call them patients, because we think that they are actually being patients uh, for a future technology. Recognize this metaphor. What's this look like? People going over the edge of the cliff. There's something like seven billions of them on the planet. Most of us are happily walking like this. Boom, falling over the edge of the cliff called aging and death. And it would be really nice if some of us were to take this major leap and try to breach this chasm. And the whole idea behind Quranics is that it is a bridge to a future technology. Quranics is a bridge to a future technology, and that's the thing I want us to really get in our heads. That's the clear metaphor. It's not unfair. It's very fair. This so basically is designed to help us work together to basically get in a bridge. Now, there are people who say Quranics looks more like this dystopian bridge. Uh, that's pretty awful. But I would submit to you that Quranics is basically a work in progress. It's this bridge that is being built to that future technology. Can we guarantee it's going to work? No. If you, one of the different distinctions in epistemology between this church and most churches is we don't give you bullshit and call, say you've got to believe it. Instead, we want you to make up your mind based on legitimate facts and evidence and research. We believe in an epistemology of evidence. And it's a little challenging because right now we right now we don't have a actually solid evidence that Quranics works if you define evidence as can we bring back a human being from Quranic temperature? No, we can't do that yet. Matter of fact, we can't bring back a dog or a cat or a rat from Quranic temperature. We can bring back organs in some cases. And the I, if Quranics can work right now, if you define works as preserves everything in the current state that it's in. So anyway, this is a bridge. And this is little in the idea behind Quranics. We're building a little ramp here. And maybe that ramp can be built big enough to bridge that chasm if we work together. I love this. Now, you're going to love this. How many of us, any of us have any operation? Have you ever had an operation? That's good. Let me ask you this question. How many of you were under anesthesia for that operation. Well, you bunch of sissies. Are you serious? My friend Bill Falloon, as I understand, I, I could be wrong about this, but I don't know if you want me to say this or not, Bill. Yeah. Now, Bill ain't a sissy. Uh, it's my understanding he had the, the thing that stick the tube down your throat. Endoscopies and colonoscopies without anesthesia. Oh. Well, we won't go there. Uh, but suffice it to say, most of us, <laughs> the, uh, 
most of us appreciate the benefit of anesthesia. Uh, I had, as of this morning, this morning, folks, I had the results of my PET scan that we, my oncologist went over. I am 60 years old. This is called total self-disclosure. I'm trying to make this interesting and relevant. As of, yes? Wow, very interesting. Thank you. Cardiac anesthesiologist. Cool. Very outstanding. Thank you for your service. I appreciate that. Point being, you, I, I suspect those people that were going in the cardiac situations, you basically put them to sleep. They didn't have to suffer during their operation. Yeah. So I hear, here's the point. What's amazing is you study the history of cardiology, and I, I bet this guy could provide a nice little summary for us. But there was a period of time, most, throughout most of human history, obviously, operations were not done under anesthesia. They were cutting people your arm off, and you're sitting there watching it. Uh, that would be pretty uncomfortable for most of us. When they did my little biopsy operation, I didn't want to be conscious. I'm not Bill Falloon. I, I wanted to be as asleep as possible. So the point being, there was a time when that was considered freakish. It was considered immoral. Matter of fact, most of these technologies, if you study the history of them, were not only took a while to develop and become uh, promulgated throughout the system, but most of them were aggressively fought by, guess what, our friends who are, wear those religious robes. Basically, they've been kind of on the wrong side of progress for decades and centuries, and they still have a surprising amount of credibility with certain folks. But the point being that these technologies, anesthesia, defibrillation, IVF, organ transplants, all of them were controversial. Matter of fact, a bunch of them thought, they, people thought they were pseudoscience, they thought it couldn't work, they thought it was playing God. We know that, right? This, this is history. This isn't, we're not making this stuff up. What if this happens? What if medical stasis in cryonics becomes that next thing? And I submit to you that's kind of what, we're, what where we have with cryonics. It's a medical intervention that is in the early stages that will be viewed the way these other things are, now, are viewed now. Although some, by the way, IVF is still kind of uh, controversial. So basically, the, this bridge will be perfected. So obviously, the question is this. How good is, this, is the science supporting cryonics? Well, we, first of all, we don't, we, if we believe in epistemology of evidence, not authoritarian uh, pronouncements, but it is kind of nice if people who are in author authorities do have some kind of uh, approval. This happens to be a scientist open letter, uh, about 69 signatories of top scientists from multiple fields saying that basic, saying that cryonics is a legitimate scientific intervention. You can read that. Um, basically, they're simply, they're not saying cryonics works in every situation. They're simply saying it is indeed there's a distinction between proto-science, early science, and pseudoscience. This is not woo-woo. This is not trying to cure cancer with uh, herbal tea. Uh, by the way, Steve Jobs had cancer. Is it Steve Jobs? Pancreatic cancer. Uh, Steve Jobs tried to cure his cancer with, I understand, fruit juice and herbal teas and things. Uh, I had cancer. And uh, I used... Uh, thing you might have heard of called chemotherapy. Um, Steve Jobs died. I lived. I found out this morning my PET scan was 100% clear. Uh, um, so thank you. I appreciate that. I, I promise you, my wife and I were both crying. We were grabbing the oncologist. It was embarrassing. But the uh, point being, uh, as near as I can tell, it makes me smarter than Steve Jobs, but I could be wrong. Uh, the point being, technology kind of works. Technology, it continues to improve our lives and save lives. So that's obvious. So let's talk about what, this, what the science are. We're going to talk about five proof of principle ideas. I love this baby. This baby represents the thousands, probably hundreds of thousands, of people who have been frozen embryos, frozen sperm, frozen eggs, who are now walking around today. They're called snowflake children. Did you know that? There's thousands of them. It's been, it's been done for decades. It's mainstream science as part of IVF. You guys know this. This is, this is not speculative stuff. This is existing now. So anyway, what about 
here's the other very important question. A lot of folks say, well, you know, I understand the whole idea behind Quranics, but the, I don't think that our brain pattern could actually be preserved because there's a lot of very smart people who think, well, maybe our, maybe our memories are something like the patterns on a soap bubble. And I don't care how good your science are, it's, pre is, it's pretty hard to keep the patterns on a soap bubble preserved. But now we have, thanks to Natasha Vita Moore and her colleagues, actual scientific proof published in a peer-reviewed journal that brain patterns and your memories are indeed, can be preserved through the Quranic temperature down to 196C. This, a uh, friend here, this, I don't know if this is the exact one, he's a C. elegans, and he's not as smart as you or I, I don't think. But he does, they can be taught to do something. They basically can be taught to go left or right, given, given a certain smell. And uh, the experiment here had to do with teaching the C. elegans to go left upon a certain smell. And then they took them out. You can cryopreserve these things. They're really small. Took them out, cryopreserved them down to 196C, waited in some cases hours, in other cases days, rewarmed them, they, are, they pop back into life, not all of them, but most of them. And here's the most important thing. Guess what? They remembered their training. Turning the computer off doesn't mean the computer pattern goes away. Pretty important prin principle, proof of concept. Uh, so anyway, this is indeed what we call legitimate medical proof that memories, at least some memories, can be preserved. Um, what about this? You ever hear about people who literally um, go have their heart stopped, have their lungs stopped, have their brain stopped, basically for all practical purposes are dead? Uh, I believe, Ford, you'd asked me the question we were interviewing for the transhumanist film earlier. What about, you know, do you have, when you have, when you die, could you be preserved, cry preserved when you're still alive? You have to, because when you're dead, that doesn't mean you, you're dead? That's a reasonable question, but the answer is no, not really. Any of us know people who have had been pronounced dead or maybe had their heart stopped for a while during cryosurgery. Uh, it's legit. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. How many of them? Wow. Well, how long, sir? Hours? On a heart, on a heart and lung machine. My goodness. And it, were they cooled down at that time or not? So basically, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that there's the proof of principle here that be death is not necessarily death. Your heart stopping is not necessarily permanent. There is also, how about this guy? You ever hear about people who actually have, were cooled down? This guy was, he looks okay there. He was a, his name is Justin Smith. Frozen solid, not in perfect medical conditions. It was frozen solid in a snowbank. And, uh, came back. Again, it's not recommended. This is not ideal Quranic's temperatures. We're talking about proof, proof of concept here. This is, so we'd call that a straight freeze, I guess. Uh, so again, proof of concept. To tell you the truth, I don't know. But if he's pro, what's that? 26 hours? My goodness. I don't know. That's, that's longer than I would have expected. 26 hours, and his brain's obviously there. Uh, so basically, the people who revived after clinically dead, it's simply, it's, this is mainstream science, folks. Being cool slows one down, down, down your metabolism. Pretty, any of us uh, eat food? Any of us eat food that's been refrigerated? Why, why do we do that? We do that because cooling stuff down slows down biological processes. Yeah, I know this is like second grade stuff, folks. Clearly, there's folks out there that don't understand that principle does continue to, to provide at least a proof of concept here. Uh, we refrigerate food because slowing things, slowing the biological activity down upon what it called cooling works. But all that is a moot point if, this, if it takes $10 million, none of us have $10 million. What if Kranix were affordable? Here's the intriguing thing. We not only have this emerging technology, there's another technology called insurance. That basically, and the confluence of these two things all of a sudden makes for a pretty cool, cool possibilities here. It turns out that human beings of normal, normal income can't afford Quranics. There's people in this room who I know are not wealthy who are signed up and fully funded for Quranics. These are, uh, these are, 
These examples I pulled, by the way, these are not the human being what they look like, but these are actual to the penny examples of human beings that I personally have signed up the policies for. So this is, this is not, this is not theoretical stuff here. This is as hard data as we can get. This guy is named John. He bought a $300,000, an index universal life policy basically is a permanent level coverage, coverage premium where the premium stays level, the cost stays level, and the, the coverage never decreases. As a matter of fact, the death benefit actually increases over time. In this case, he's investing 185 bucks a month. Now, that's not trivial, I admit. But there are people who can handle that. 185 bucks a month. And besides that, it's not just a life insurance policy. In this case, it's a cash accumulation vehicle that grows or projects at his age 100 to the rather substantial figure of about $1.7 million. We think no matter how inflated those dollars are, about $1.7 million would still be helpful to have. So we've got a couple more examples here. This is a nurse. Uh, 37, bought 150,000 index universal life, paying 151 a month for cash accumulation. The cash value as well as the death benefit grows to about $1.2 million. Now these are slightly younger people. We're gonna do, we're gonna do a whole range of folks here. Um, this guy's a PhD student and he's poor. Doesn't make him a bad guy, makes him poor. Uh, but, and so when he started out with a thing called a term life insurance, term life insurance is level for a term or period of time, perfect for a lot of things, not necessarily ideal for Quranics funding because we want to make a have a policy ideally that stays in place in the later years where the, without the cost going up astronomically. But meanwhile, it's affordable in the early years and gets him the coverage he needs and he can upgrade over time. He's paying 344 bucks a year, less than a dollar a day for his Quranics policy. So that's a real world, real deal. Uh, this is a, this lady's an investor. She buys a $300,000 policy and she's gonna do something else. She's gonna pay it off in a single swoop. You can write a check. Some people in this room are probably able to write a check where you pay the policy off in a one foul swoop and you never have to worry about it again, which is kind of nice because sometimes future, the future is uncertain. In this case, you could write a $65,000 check that creates that $300,000 benefit, or she can pay it off in seven years at 12000 or so a year, or write annual checks of 2600 So there's a couple different ways to get the policy paid off. Uh, and which, obviously, as you get older, the costs do go up. Sorry, folks. This is reality. Reality is, reality is what it is. And this guy waited too long, but he didn't wait super too long. He's 70. He's a retired uh, pilot. And he's going to buy 100, get 160,000 of coverage and pay about 7,700 bucks a year. Not a trivial number. I'm not going to pretend that's trivial, but it is often doable. And so the the whole concept here is that Quranix is typically affordable for many people, although not everybody. And the leverage of life insurance makes a huge difference. That makes sense. Is that the take-home story? All right. Turns out most people do fund their Quranix with insurance. So if people say, oh. You know, that, not only is that idea not, not going to work, but it's a stupid, the bad use of resources because it's crazy expensive. You now have the reality that's not crazy expensive for many people. Um, and there, to be fair, you know, I believe in being fair, in addition to your Quranics insurance costs, there are membership dues with the Quranics organization. In the case of Alcor, it's about 500 bucks a year. In the case of the Quranics Institute, about 120 a year. So those are costs that are in addition to your insurance costs. So the third section, and stay with me, folks. Stay with me, stay with me, stay with me. Hop up and down. I'm gonna, if, you, if I see anybody nodding off, we're going to make you all stand up and dance around or something because we believe in trying to keep this stuff interesting. And the march of technology, you've, I'm sure you, if you've been come to this church, if you've been reading stuff, you've heard this, a lot of these ideas before. But I want to connect these ideas. The march of technology does not just mean that we may not have to have cryonics at all. It's not, it's not an end in itself. It's a reasonable plan B for smart people. But it also means that the ideas of the ex, ex, exponential growth of technology will mean that cryonics is, makes more sense and is certainly almost certain to be viable. And how do we document that? We document that by, a host, by proving how great our technology is. And it actually works. Look, I changed the slide. 
You've seen, these, you've seen this curve before. This is the increasing amount of computer information that is available for a thousand bucks. And we're heading toward a uh, rapid movement where we can go buy a computer that can do what a human will for a thousand bucks. Will that change things? The universe is getting fast here, folks. We know that you've seen the exponential information. I guess I, I want to pound this stuff in. It turns out that we are designed to think linearly. I'm sure you've heard Ray Kurzweil rant about this because every time I've seen him, he's seen him a dozen times, he rants about the same thing every time. He says, yeah, we're designed, we think linearly, but things can happen on an exponential basis. And it's hard to have, Matt, look at the diff difference there. 30 steps in linear fashion gets us 30 steps. 30 exponential steps gets us 26 times around the earth. And all of these are things that are occurring. I'm going to fly through these. Basically, there's, you probably heard of Zuckerberg. I, I just heard that, I heard in a, on a self-improvement tape I was listening to on the way down here, that Zuckerberg is worth $45 billion. I don't know, if, is that true? Anybody know if that's true or not? It sounded like a big number. Anyway, you may know that he has committed his fortune to basically curing diseases. Uh, that's a big deal. Um, this, is a, some, this is an initiative that you're going to love. I don't care if you think, if you hate cryonics. You're going to love this initiative. This is the most exciting thing. I've been an active in cryonics for 23 years. This is my bracelet. If you got one of these things on, you get cryopreserved. If you don't, you don't. It's a binary deal. But quite frankly, most of us have expected a lot more progress in cryonics than we've seen in the last 20-something years. However, look at this. Our friends, the Organ Preservation Alliance, have made amazing progress in just a couple of years. It's a little easier to get people to accept the idea of organ preservation because everybody knows somebody who needed an organ, who needed, who had a bad, or basically our, our good friend we square dance with had a lung transplant. Great guy. Guess what? He had a horrible quality of life for two years and then died. By the way, the total, total cost of his operations was about almost a million bucks. Uh, and people say cryonics is is a ridiculous use of resources. In contrast, if we could have had organs that are, that are printed and banked, he, we can replace organs all of a sudden. That completely changes the game. Yes, sir? I cannot speak to that, but I'm glad you brought it up, and I bet somebody else could. Thank you. The, uh, what, what I can speak to is this. The Organ Preservation Alliance basically has already in a short period of time managed to become, get a whole lot of big mainstream players. Have you ever heard of DARPA? What, what is DARPA? Somebody give me the name, acronym. Defense Advanced Research Projects. Basically, it's a, it's a big, big check writing organization. You've probably heard of the internet. The DARPA basically helped fund the internet. A little bit of, of life-changing stuff. Anyway, DARPA, I believe, has put a committed about 100 million bucks toward organ preservation. Main, big, mainstream pharma is, and these guys have been convening symposia, that's plural symposium, to do organ preservation that are, is backed by the White House, backed by a bunch of big-name players. It's a function of the guy that running it, who's a personal friend, and he happens to have a background at Yale and Harvard. It turns out if you've got a background at Yale and Harvard, you kind of run with the right people, and you can influence some of the big decision makers, which is kind of cool. So anyway, that, that is a great thing that's happening. It speaks to organ preservation and organ biobanking and organ cryopreservation is obviously on the direct path toward reversible cryostasis. That makes sense? Got it. Look at this. This weekend, guess what's happening over in Spain? We're not there. <laughs> Unfortunately, these, I see Karen. Karen is smiling. I know Karen was annoyed that, that this, this conference happened to be at the same time that the International Longevity Cryo Cryopreservation Conference in Spain is happening. Uh, you, any of you been to the RAD or think about going to the RAD? I'm sure they've been haranguing you about the RAD here. The RAD, co-sponsored by Bill Falloon, is one of the coolest or, uh, operations. It basically, it's going to be in... San Diego, my wife and I will be there August 9th through 13th of this year. A lot of, and what happened July 20th, 1969? Yes, sir, absolutely. Man on the moon, absolutely, big deal. Any of you remember seeing that? 
And that, we know that was a world-changing change. Humanity did something that will never happen again. It was a one-time deal. I remember seeing it. It was in the little black and white TV. This, I think, when the history of the planet is written, will be a bigger watershed event. You remember, see, you remember seeing this, this happen? What was this? This was Watson. February 14th, 2011, just a couple years ago, a watershed event. The future of our planet will probably be written by AIs and computers. And uh, when they, they're, they're going to like this event. That, when all of a sudden Watson runs Jeopardy, an impossible thing to happen. I thought it'd never happen. It happened five or six years ago. So, in conclusion, a couple of, couple of bullet points. Uh, we don't expect you to take a word for this. We want you to use your research, use, your, use the intelligence that you have to check out to see if this might be a good fit for you. Um, Neil has enjoined me to not be terribly commercial, and I'm not going to be. This is unusual for me. Uh, shut up, Neil. It's true. <laughs> but hey, I've not had a commercial yet, but I'm gonna, I may get one here. Uh, but the, it's because when people ask me what's the easiest way to find out about, you know, the affordability of cranics or the, more about this, I wish there was another, you know, you can go to the Alcor.org site. You can put cranics in a search engine. But one of the better resources out there, quite frankly, is my website, RudyHoffman.com. You don't have to get there through RudyHoffman.com. Go to Cryonics and I, I pop up. Because quite frankly, I'm a big deal in Cryonics funding. I'm not a big deal in everything else, but this is my world. This is the one thing I'm really world class at. Two out of three human beings on the, on the planet who signed up for Cryonics have done, the fund, done it with my funding. Again, that's not because I'm a big shot. It's because I don't do it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you very much. It's, I'm, the, I'm the rock star of this thing. So anyway, it would be a shame if this thing passed you by, and I would encourage you to at least check it out. And here's my official, bring it with the altar close. Uh, I would really encourage you to make a commitment to yourself to consider this option. Rudy Hoffman, thank you very much. All right. There's my official thanks. I want to thank these wonderful people, including Doug Baldwin, who helped me make this. Hey, let's put that back thing. up, whoever's yeah, put got that, the control. Yeah, let's put that acknowledgement slide back up because. Uh, well, let's leave it right there. Yes. Now, what I'm going to do, Rudy, if I may, let yes. me swap microphones with you. Yes. And if you do a Q&A. Yes, absolutely. All right. I knew he would. Uh, small, but we have a small but non-hostile audience here. <laughs> so uh, here's a chance if you have any questions right. to get those questions stump, answered. Stump the, stump the speaker. Stump the speaker. All and, right. And please don't ask me questions about the longevity gene. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. Don't worry. I will. I will. Here's a question. Of the, what we're going to do is handle these questions on the microphone because we are live streaming. We're recording we this. Oh, and so right. you know, you're, you're a PowerPoint. We can make this available if, with your permission and put it on our website. Absolutely. So, uh, this PowerPoint so is open source. I uh, would love it on your website. I'm going to put it on my website. It's we'll do available that for anybody. So here's a question from Bob. Yes, hi. Uh, the Alcor Life Extension Foundation and the Cryonics Institute, are they equal in terms of technology? Yeah, that's a great question. Thank you. Bob, is it? Yes. Thank you, Bob. Uh, that's a great question and a question that I want to handle with sensitivity and dignity and, and still accuracy. They're both fine organizations. They've both been around a long time. Uh, CI, the Cryonics Institute, has been around, I think, 37 years, perhaps. Um, Alcor, close to 45. Uh, they're both reasonably well-funded. There is a pretty big distinction in um, costs as well as corporate culture. And the, uh, the, they're both fine organizations. CI is considerably lower in cost, um, not as much lower as you might think, but the actual global cost of CI, suspended animation, which is a transport organization, and air ambulance is about 140,000 uh, as opposed to 200,000 for Alcor. Uh, Alcor does put more money into the patient care trust fund. There's a patient care trust fund designed to take care of the patients in perpetuity as well as ideally having money for resuscitation. Uh, so they're both fine organizations. What we encourage people to do is kind of make a determination based on researching them both, figuring out what the cost would be for both. And a lot of times if you're younger, it, the actual cost is not that big a deal. Some people who are younger get enough insurance in place or get enough coverage in place to sign up with Alcor but sign up with CI originally because their dues are, they like paying 120 bucks a year dues instead of 520. Was that responsive to your question? Thank you. I have you. a question over here from Jessica. Hi, 
Well, it's um, not so much a question, it's just an additional resource if people are interested in learning more about cryonics. Um, there's a really fantastic introductory article available on a blog called waitbutwhy.com, which wow. I would highly recommend. Absolutely. Wait, Thank but you. why? I'm so glad you brought that up. Matter of fact, the, I, the title of this talk, Why Cryonics Makes Sense, is directly from Tim Urban. Tim Urban, who writes that blog called Wait But Why. Uh, I've been writing cryonics insurance for 23 years, been writing insurance and investments as an independent broker for nearly 40. Uh, the Wait But Why article that, that Tim Urban wrote has been the most influential single piece that has ever occurred in cryonics. Uh, more, more influential than the front page of the New York Times, which is surprising, because he's got a he's got a following of people who like who re, like his rational explanations of stuff, and he did a great it's a great article, best article I've I've written articles on cryonics, it's better than mine. Wait, but why article? It's called uh, Why Cryonics Makes Sense. Thank you for that bringing that up. Thank you, Jessica. And here's a question from Don. Yeah, Rudy, I'd like to know the Alcor uh, Foundation has been there since 1972 in Arizona. You said right? Correct. How long are those bodies preserved for, and how long? When do they look at them, or yeah, that, that's, bring them back that's to a, life? Not all of them have been there. From the, there's not that many people there since 1972. Most of the there's about 150 people, I believe, in cryopreservation at Alcor. About the same number at CI that have been in, and maybe twice that many pets. Uh, they've they've. It doesn't really matter how they once once you hit liquid nitrogen temperature, the whether it's 30 years or 300 years or 3,000 years, if you, stay in, if you stay in liquid nitrogen temperature, the pattern is exactly the same. Um, so some of them have been there for decades. And they periodically do take a look at them to make sure to see what, um, how well the new protocols are working. The thing I did not mention, because this is designed to be a very non-technical presentation, I did not talk about vitrification, which is the new, newer technology designed to reduce or almost completely eliminate freezing damage. Uh, if, we, if you're properly prever preserved with a cryoprotective agent, that ha you can be vitrified and everything kind of glassifies in place. So that, that's a, was that responsive to your question? Good Thank answer. You. you know, there was a, some work done by uh, Robert uh, McIntyre and Greg Fahey on the rabbit brain. You want to uh, talk about that for a moment? Um, not really? I, I heard the presentation, but why, why don't you talk about it? No, no, that's okay. I, I just wanted to send it that way. We have a couple other questions, and then we're going to get underway. I have a question here from Mike. Yes, uh, I think you mentioned something about pets a moment ago, but also what is the youngest person? Any babies? Uh, what about pets? And then a third thing would be, you mentioned it as well, there's a psychological block or something where people will say, no, I, I wouldn't want to live forever, which is a, a mentally unbalanced perspective, actually. Would you have any comments as to why people oh, yeah. don't embrace I, it? I can, I can identify the infer first information, the, uh, uh, because it was in the front of Cryonics magazine. They just, Alcor recently cryopreserved for a beautiful young girl who's two years old, I believe, from Singapore, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, and her picture is in the front of Cryonics magazine. It's beautiful, beautiful juice. Not everybody's out of the, not all cryonicists who are signed up are out of the closet. I'm, uh, yeah, what was her name? Yes, Thailand. So two years old, I know, is, is at a, there, are, there are people who, and the, the other thing, why is this idea not caught on more? Why do people think, you know, where I, I, death gives meaning to life and that kind of thing? Uh, that is a much bigger question. I, I think it's religious nonsense that's been pushed so heavily that it's hard, hard, most people have a hard time getting it past it. We have one more question in the back here, and we'll go to Adam. So we've been able to suspend life for the long term. Uh, are there any organizations that are actively working to perfect the restoration process from the cryogenics? Yes, and I think Bill Falloon can address that very much because he's funding them. Uh, he's at least funding some of them. Actually, to tell you the truth, he's funding most of them. But um, the, the short answer is yes. We, wanna, we, we, need the, we know we need to understand and work on not just the original cryopreservation, but the resuscitation process. So the bottom line is this thing is, in hap is happening, it's real, it deserves your attention. I would encourage you, I, I, let's face it, we gotta get emotional here a moment, folks. This is not just rational. You've got to make a internal commitment in your own brain that this is something you might wanna check out, get on the web and check out, and look at, do your own research, 
because it can and might enable you and I to live and see the year 3000. If anti-aging doesn't get here quick, or if it even does get here quick and you get hit by a bus tomorrow, this is the thing you should do. I will close to that. Thank you very much. Big hand for Rudy. All right, Rudy. Well done. Good job. Great job, Rudy. You're always a wonderful speaker and entertaining guy. And I love to see him coming a mile away with those purple jackets and uh, crazy sneakers that he wears. But he's a, he's a wealth of information. He's been in involved with cryonics, as he said, for 23 years. He's been around for a long time and has a lot of wisdom in him, and I appreciate you sharing with us tonight, Rudy. And in all fairness, th there's... <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> I don't know. I think, we, that, I think that talk was pretty darn good. Here at church, the Church of Perpetual Life, we do not endorse any specific uh, service or product. We don't endorse any political parties or platforms, but, uh, and so in, in all fairness, I, I can mention that uh, getting life insurance is one way to fund cryonics. There are other ways. You can, as he mentioned, you can write a check. You can, you can uh, I, I, I was talking with some people about the process of taking your real estate portfolio and making that the way to fund cryonics. There, there are inventive ways, and we have to get inventive, and we have to uh, uh, look at all kinds of ways of, of handling things. But uh, I'm, I'm signed up. Here's my bracelet. Um, I, <laughs> I, can't, I can't get my, I got a neck chain on too. For those of you who like neck chain, I got that on too. And yes, and, and Rudy, uh, Rudy helped me to, to get signed up quickly. He was very efficient, and I thank you for that. But again, th th we're not making endorsements. Uh, if, if you decide to go with Alcor or Cryonics Institute, I, I recommend checking everybody out. And in all fairness, there are other organizations that are, or that are, that are, uh, Coming along as well, there's the or, or, what is it, Oregon Cryonics yeah. Institute. There, there's uh, also uh, Osiris here in South Florida. Uh, there's Cryo Rust. Cryo Rust is rather, I think, the third largest in in uh, Russia. Uh, and there's a startup coming in Australia. I understand there are two coming in China. Of course, we don't know what the news is from China and uh, what what's real news and what's fake news. But I suspect there's probably three or four coming in China. It's huge in China. So. Uh, there's a, actually, there's a, a researcher, Shoshi Wei, I'm looking forward to talking with. And Shoshi Wei, when I met her, she said, you know, there's a toad or a frog in Canada that every year freezes like a rock and comes out of a frozen suspension and hops around and knows where the bugs are to eat. And, uh, you know, it, this is something that is in nature. It freezes like a rock for six months or however long and then comes back out of that stasis. And she was looking at the fluids that uh, were in that amphibian to determine maybe that could be something that can be used in mammals. And so she, that, that's cutting edge stuff. That's really cool stuff. And I'm, 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 it's my honor to, to know Rudy and Shoshi Wei and, and uh, those of you who are involved in the cryonics movement. So again, uh, you'll have an opportunity to, to talk with Rudy and others this evening. I uh, want to reiterate the fact that we will have your PowerPoint on our website within the week, and thank you, Alex, for doing that. And uh, we'll also, have, of course, have this video, the video of Rudy's presentation, and all of the presentations tonight will be able to be seen on our YouTube channel, and the YouTube link is in our website where you can go and uh, look at all of these, uh, all of the channels, all, all of the uh, videos that we have both this evening's event, which will be probably live a couple hours after the event, as well as all of the events going all the way back to the grand opening, which was in November of 2013. So let's go ahead and bring up our next speaker, a gentleman that needs no introduction, but I'd like to give him a great one. Let's give a great hand to our own founder of the Church of Perpetual Life, Mr. Bill Falloon. Thank you, Neil. We're going to talk about a problem and a solution. And a lot of people don't realize this problem is starting to become serious. Uh, you were shown a picture of a building. That building is owned free and clear by Alcor. And it's a neat building because it allows them to expand inside so that it can house more and more cryopreserved people. These are people just like you and me who were alive at one point. They're currently disabled. We just have to wait until the technology emerges to reanimate them. Uh, the Michigan building is also owned free and clear. Both of these organizations are very well funded. 
so you don't have to worry about them going out of business anytime soon. And inside the Michigan group, lots and lots of cryopreserved patients, people that we need to be able to reanimate someday. Now, what's happening, and a lot of people are viewing this as good news, but it's a little bit of a challenge, and that is cryonics is becoming somewhat popular. If you look at this chart, this reflects the number of Alcor members. And if you look at the Cryonics Institute chart of membership, it's almost identical, about the same number of members and the same type of membership growth. Now, these are fully signed up, prepaid or with insurance, whatever way they do it, fully signed up cryopreservation members. These people will all likely be cryopreserved when they deanimate. We use the word deanimate rather than die because we plan to reanimate these temporarily disabled individuals. As it relates to the number of people that Alcor is storing, it is also skyrocketing, relatively speaking. If you look at 1980, it was almost nobody, and it's been rising rather quickly. Looks like a really good business model, but these are really just nonprofit entities. These are all charities. This is the way we pursue cryonics via the charitable route rather than through a business. But as you can see, the number of Alcor patients is growing, just like the number of Cryonics Institute patients are growing, and there's going to be a space limitation. You can only house so many people until you run out of room, and you want to keep everyone under one roof for security purposes. Ergo, our reason for designing a facility called the Timeship. The Timeship won't have much in the way of space limitation because we've got lots of space to build lots of timeships if we need to. The concept of timeship was conceived 20 years ago by Saul Kent and myself. That was year 1997. We looked for property for the next eight years all around the United States because we wanted to get a piece of property that was not going to have an earthquake fault open up underneath of it, which is a problem with California and much of the western United States. We don't want hurricanes, tornadoes. We don't want snowstorms. We don't want any natural or man-made disasters to interfere with the safe and secure storage of the cryopreservation patients. So with a lot of analysis, and I'm talking about a lot of analytical data, we identified a place in the Texas Hill Country. Some people don't know there are some mountains in Texas but they're right outside of San Antonio, 45 minutes away, and that is the safest geographical location in the United States, way above sea level in an incredible location, and this is where the time ship were, will be built. Now, this is a, a rendering of how the time ship will likely appear once it is constructed on about 1,000 acres of property. The building itself in the center will be about six acres big. Now, you'll, you'll see the, in the uh, hexagon there, you'll see what will be the visitor's reception center where people will be put through security screening and then they will be able to uh, go through a little museum, again, in that little red circle. And then if you look to the uh, bottom right-hand side of, of that entire uh, uh, hexagon, you'll see a little amphitheater because people who come in for tours will be given maybe a 45-minute presentation as to what they're going to see inside the time ship. And the only way to get inside the time ship will be an underground tunnel. Uh, that's where that little line between where the, the hexagon is and then the big time ship building in the middle. Uh, at the other side, by the way, is a service entrance. And again, that will only be accessible via the underground tunnel. This is all for security purposes. We spent a lot of money on architects, engineers, designers, lots and lots of money to make sure that we do this right. Security, big concern. All kinds of unpredictable events might occur in the future. We are building safeguards against each and every one of them, including someone who might want to drive up with a truck and blow it up. We are designing it so it can withstand a rather heavy blast without ever even penetrating the outer wall, the time ship, by building it very high above where any truck could ever pull up. So we've, uh, we've engaged and retained a lot of security engineers to make sure that as we're putting this time ship project together, we're going to put together a building that's going to withstand pretty much any kind of insult. Now, the property that we were able to acquire, we got really lucky, and that is some people made a lot of money in the 1980s, and they put it all into an incredible 1,000-acre piece of property in the Texas Hill Country. They built a, a mansion that has been on Lifestyles of the Rich and Famous twice. It's got all the things that people squander money on. They put it all into this mansion. They put it into houses all around the property, and then they, well, they went broke and they were able to sell it uh, to someone for a small amount of money, and I'll tell you that story, but this is the inside of the mansion. We have kind of a time ship uh, museum as to how the time ship will look. 
We have renderings of uh, time ship models. We have renderings of intermediate temperature storage facilities because we're looking to store people at somewhat higher temperature where less cellular damage occurs. So this gives you an idea of what's inside what used to be a luxury mansion. We've converted it into a kind of a museum and a workspace for people. This is another picture, by the way, of the mansion. It's got this incredible brick wall all around it and a white fence around it. The fencing alone on this property would cost millions of dollars. The people, again, who built this, they're now deceased, by the way. Instead of putting money into research, maybe to find a way to keep them from dying, they put it into this structure, and we were able to acquire it for a very small amount of money, considering what the cost was. It is a very inspirational place to visit. Um, we've had a couple meetings there, and people leave it saying, you know, for the first time, even though they may have been signed up with the cryonics for a long time, they just get a feeling of peace, serenity, and the fact this may really work because we're putting effort into it now while we're alive to ensure we're going to have a lot of space to store a lot of cryopreserved people. Again, these are just photographs of the mansion area of, of, of money that we never would have spent, but we were able to acquire this, as I said, for just pennies on the dollar considering what the people spent on it originally. And it is a lot of, of property and a lot of amenities that they put in that cause it to get world-renowned attention. Lifestyles are rich and famous. Now, most of the timeship property is rolling hill country. We can think we think we can put about three or four timeship buildings easily on this thousand acres of land that surrounds it. And again, everything is fenced in, fencing that would cost a lot of money if we were to do it ourselves. But this all came with the property, which we acquired back around 2007. So we've owned it for 10 years. We've been making improvements, moving it ahead forward wherever we can. There are a number of buildings on the property already where we house interns and engineers and architects working on, again, intermediate temperature storage, which is a superior way of cryopreserving people and storing them where there's less cellular damage. Great news is we're getting publicity, the kind of publicity that cryonics has never been recognized for. Uh, front cover of the New Scientist, which is a scientific magazine. It's not a peer-reviewed journal, but it is a scientific magazine. July 4th of 2016, about 11 months ago, put the time ship on the cover and talked about the resurrect, res, Resurrection Project and talked about are people really going to be able to live forever. This was, uh, again, a scientist magazine about a, a year ago, and they did an incredible story about cryonics, the time ship, and what we're trying to accomplish, and we got a lot of interest from people who didn't even realize that there was a reanimation research facility being designed right now to figure a way how to reanimate cryopreserved individuals. I know that and that's what the purpose of the time ship is. It's the second. They're going to be young again, free of every disease that exists today. They're going to be in great shape. But at the stage that they're in, they're, we're preserving their structure. We're preserving their structure now, and we found that if we preserve them at a higher temperature, there's less molecular damage. So they're going to be revived in incredible condition because once that technology evolves, uh, aging, cancer, atherosclerosis, all these problems we're faced with today, those would have been long again cured and eradicated. So progress is going to occur, and it's being recognized. That's what we're fascinated about. For the first time, cryonics is getting recognition. This is a popular newspaper in Europe. It did a story on the time ship and again gave it really good coverage. And, and good news is they're talking about people living forever for the first time. Now that's the premise this church was set up upon is that we believe that mankind will advance technology to the point where people will live for indefinite periods and we're now getting a lot of recognition. That recognition is occurring. The city, by the way, is Comfort, Texas. Nice name for the timeship property to be in. But we're getting recognition around the world because of the work we're doing with timeship. Now Focus is a magazine that apparently is enormously popular in almost every country except the United States. You can buy it in Manhattan newsstands and that sort of thing, but they did a story over the last 12 months on timeship also. And again, they're talking about living forever. And as we start to move past that barrier of people not understanding it, we're moving it forward with publicity. And that publicity is emanating out of the timeship project. When people see the work that's going in to put this property into a, a, a realistic real world being where there'll be active scientists working on projects all around the clock, it all of a sudden seems 
more realistic. So we're getting this incredible publicity because we're thinking forward. We're thinking about the fact that cryonics facilities now are great. They, 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 they safely house cryopreserved people, but more people are signing up, which is good news. For a long time, we had a hard time signing anybody up. But right now, we probably only have room in each one of those cryonics facilities for about seven or 800 more patients. At that point, they're going to need timeship. And they're aware the timeship, which is a nonprofit entity, by the way, all of these are charitable type entities. This is available to Cryonics Institute people, Alcor people, or any other cryonics group. If it needs space to store human beings who are temporarily out of service, timeship will be available to them. And the great news is the world is picking up on it. They're picking up on the fact that technology is emerging in a way that they may not have to die or they may not have to stay dead if they do die. In other words, the technology is going to be our savior. Now this is a rendering of how one of the intermediate temperature storage vehicles might look. Can't say for sure, but this is one of the designs. This is housing eight patients in one capsule and there'll be a dual uh, liquid nitrogen system uh, where if one of the uh, units were to go down, the other one would pick it up because they'd be both the operating simultaneously. And in the middle might be the neuropreservation cases. These are people who don't always have the money for a full body cryopreservation. They go with the neuropreservation option. And there's some advantages to that, by the way. So this is how it might look. People stored temporarily. You've seen it in science fiction movies, of course. They make it look simple in, that, in those movies. It's really much more complicated. And we recognize that. And that's why we are putting this timeship project together. This is a rendering of how one of the intermediate temperature storage units might look. And how we're going to do this is have liquid nitrogen at the bottom. Currently, by the way, the patient is immersed in liquid nitrogen, which is a very uh, efficient way today to store them. But the temperature is not ideal. As Rudy mentioned, 196 degrees below zero centigrade is near absolute zero. So there's no molecular motion. We can keep that patient preserved indefinitely, but it's not the ideal temperature. It probably is around 145. Minus 145 is probably a, a better temperature where you have a little bit of molecular motion, but you have a lot less damage. So the research priority at Timeship is to perfect intermediate temperature storage. This is one example. Uh, we actually have a patent, by the way, in 2007. It was issued for the technology that we developed up until that time. We're now working on something much more advanced. But the idea is we've got cryogenic engineers working on the intermediate temperature storage project with the objective of being able to design a prototype. And once that prototype demonstrates it is effect effective and secure, then we can seriously talk about building the timeship building. This is a, another example of some of the work that's being done to put together safeguards, to put in technologies that will enable us to store people at somewhat higher temperatures and reduce some of the damage that currently goes into effect with the current technology of cryonics. So this is what the time ship's priority right now is, is to develop it. And just a couple weeks ago, Financial Times. This outside the United States, I believe, is the number one financial newspaper that people look at. And Timeship got some very nice, favorable coverage. Uh, that's, uh, this is uh, April 20th. And again, the media has picked up on the fact that lifespans do not need to be finite, that perhaps technology will evolve, just as this church has predicted it would, in which people may live forever. And the London Financial Times, this went all around the world. We got a lot of calls from it. It will house, in each one of these buildings, 10,000 cryopreserved patients. Or if there's going to be half of them neuropreservations, then we could probably house a lot more. But the word is getting out that cryonics is real, it's scientific, and there's a lot of backing, a lot of backing going into it to make it work and make it work in a way. This is Steve Valentine. He's been working on this project for 20 consecutive years. He is an architect, and he's learning a lot about cryoengineering because before we build that timeship, we've got to perfect that intermediate temperature storage vehicle. We don't want to build a timeship and realize we, we're off by a couple inches. That would be a lot of, a lot of wasted money. Uh, the Daily Mail, once they saw it in the Financial Times, they picked up on it, and then they kind of exaggerated it to 50,000 bodies. We, the media does that sometimes. But the reality is each timeship 
will house about 10,000 whole body patients. And the media, again, is continuing to report on it in a favorable way, favorable way, something that we haven't had a lot of. Well, cemeteries have space problems too. They run out of room, and I don't know what they're really gonna do with all that space when they realize that underneath those graves are nothing. I am a licensed funeral director and embalmer. I have done quite a bit of disinterments. That's where you remove someone from a cemetery plot. And typically there's very little there or nothing there. People pay money for us to dig a hole and put some dirt in a bucket and take it to a crematory or whatever. This is what people sometimes are comfortable doing. But I can tell you there's nothing pretty about what's going on underground because there's nothing there for those people. And you look at those tombstones, they cost a lot of money. They're there to mark a person's existence on this planet. I kind of like the fact that my existence may be perpetual, at least as, as it relates to me being cryopreserved, so that I have an unlimited amount of time to wait for technology to evolve to reanimate me. And as I said, cryonics is catching on. And for those early years, I've been involved, by the way, since the late 1960s. I, I, for a long time, didn't know if anybody else had an interest in this. There were reports of people doing things here and there, but before the internet, you couldn't find people. So unless you happen to find a telephone number or an address, it was very challenging to find people. So we've got people who are signing up now to be cryopreserved, and there are more people signed up, I believe, than what the current facilities are gonna be able to handle, ergo, the timeship. The timeship will be the solution. Uh, we've got the property that we own in the Comfort, Texas area, uh, about approximately 1,000 acres. Everything, by the way, is paid for. We don't borrow money and expect some miraculous solution to occur down the road to pay it off. So, so we behave in a very conservative fashion, the same way with this church. We don't borrow money. We buy what we can afford, and we will wait to move technology forward until we get more money, if we need it. But at this point, all the activities of Timeship are being funded, and all we have to wait for are future uh, de t uh, advances with that intermediate temperature storage, which probably are only a couple years away. The cryogenic engineers understand what we need to do, which is to develop a way in which we can securely store human patients at about 145 degrees uh, centigrade, minus 145 degrees, as opposed to minus 196 degrees. And by doing that, we are going to improve the odds of those people being reanimated. So that's my presentation tonight. I'd be happy to answer any questions. All right, Bill. So questions for Mr. Falloon. I have three here. Let's start here. Mark? I read it in three years. They're going to try to do a chirogenic brain implant. Any, any input in that? In three years, you're going to try to do a chirogenic <coughs> brain implant. I think what you're talking about is there's people talking about doing uh, head transplants. Uh, they've done it in the animal model, and in certain countries, they feel they'll be able to do that experimentally in people. And if they do it, it, it at least will prove a concept. And, and that is you, you can take your brain and put it on the body, and it will function. We're pretty certain that will happen anyway. I think that's what you're referring to. Here's a question from Adam. Um, yes, I'm considering that uh, it's possible to prolong life indefinitely. Wouldn't there eventually be a problem with overpopulation and wouldn't you have to have the technology to colonize outer space? We already have a situation in this planet where it's being underpopulated. Uh, a lot of countries in Europe, Japan, uh, in the next 50 years, there may no longer really be a country of Russia because they're hardly replenishing themselves at all. Now, there's so much more space in this world than what we need. It's just unreal. Farmers are starving because there's so many crops being produced beyond the capability of people to buy and eat the food. Um, no problem whatsoever with overpopulation. I could go on about it for a long time. But if you're just flying in an airplane and look down, you can sometimes look for a while and you won't even see a house or a barn or anything else, just lots and lots of property. So we have no concern whatsoever about overpopulation. We are concerned, though, about running out of space to store the cryopreservation patients, which is why the time ship was conceived 20 years ago. Okay, one more question from Bob. Yes, uh, is there any progress beyond the, the, the worm that they showed? Like in other words, a dog or some sort of a higher level animal, mammal if you will, that they they've potentially have brought back or can bring back? Are they working on that? Yeah, there's an organization that we support called 21st Century Medicine in Southern California, also one called Critical Care Research. Uh, they work around the clock cryopreserving organs, 
tissues and rewarming them. Their, their most incredible feat was taking a rabbit kidney and cryopreserving the kidney and then transplanting it into a different rabbit and the kidney functioned. And they do that kind of research around the clock. They're outside of Riverside, California. I've been to the facility maybe three times and it's pretty much out of a science fiction movie. Lots and lots of scientists running around in white lab coats, lots of different rooms with different research projects going on, scanning, tunneling, electron microscopes, which they use to verify are they freezing cells with damage or without damage. And what fascinated me the most when I was out there, they had a brain slice uh, on a, a microscope and they were also uh, monitoring its electrical activity and they were getting an electroencephalograph response to this previously cryopreserved brain slice. Now this was about six years ago when I saw them doing it, and I was impressed that they had taken something, a, a rabbit brain that had been cryopreserved, and they were getting EEG readings. And they looked at me and said, well, we've been doing this for a long time. This is easy. And I was thinking, wow, I didn't know it. I just thought at some point they'd develop it, and they had already been doing it at a laboratory that I fund. So there are people working around the clock to perfect the cryopreservation process. It is by no means perfected now. Uh, as far as reanimation, there are people up in Oregon we are also helping to support, and they are trying to work on reanimation. But how that's going to probably roll out is a big company will figure out a way via nanotechnology to perform all kinds of biomedical miracles. We'll take that technology, that nanotechnology, and translate it into the reanimation of cryopreserved people. So it's unlikely that. I'm, I'm going to be able to, or even the people we know, will ever have that resource base to develop this technology, but we know IBM and the big companies, they're going to do it because they're going to make lots of money at it. And then we'll simply use that technology, just like we do with cryonics. We use medical equipment and medical people to cryopreserve. Uh, we'll use that technology to re reanimate also. One last question from Mike, and after this, you'll keep in mind you'll be able to speak with Bill after the event. Mike? Uh, the universe is infinite in space, energy, and resources, and my question to you is, what do you see as the financial potential of this? Because nowadays, um, recently, scientists are finally being the ones to actually grow and become entrepreneurial and see the benefits of their work. This has the potential to, p this is the number one product once it works that everyone will have to have and will want. There is no larger industry. Th this puts oil to shame. Well, you, we, I could quote one of the founders uh, uh, of cryonics. His name was Curtis Henderson. He worked with Saul Kent uh, in New York in the early days. And he absolutely predicted cryonics would become the absolute biggest business in the world. And I was with Curtis about six weeks before he died. Uh, he was about 82 years of age, and he looked at me, and I'll never forget what he said. Uh, Curtis had a real interesting character to him, but he just said, Bill, you have no idea how horrible it is to get old. And he had just a lot of comorbidities, a lot of problems, and six weeks later he died, and he was cryopreserved. And I want to make an announcement tonight also. Uh, I was called today, uh, one of those calls you don't really like to get, co-founder of this church, uh, Mr. Saul Kent. Uh, he, his wife had been in a seriously ill individual for the last several years and in declining health. But last night, he talked to her on the phone, and she was talking about getting out of the hospital. And this happens a lot. People uh, don't realize how bad off they are, and sometimes the doctors don't either. But about seven hours later, she died. And uh, she was uh, cryopreserved at Alcor uh, very quickly, by the way. They do have a suspended animation organization in Southern California. They had her on uh, life support. Uh, for several hours while the cryonics team mobilized. And that's actually an ideal situation, by the way. About eight out of 10 cryopreservations are done in an ideal way where the suspension team is there, ready to go. The other 20%, unfortunately, it's a sudden death. In some cases, you don't find a person for many hours, many days. Those people don't have such a good chance of being revived. But in the case of Saul Kent's wife, um, the hospital had no problem keeping her on life support. So she was getting oxygenation and they basically were able to cryopreserve her in a very, very good situation. I spoke with Saul today. Uh, he was, uh, he's a realist like I am. Uh, he deals with adversity like I do, and uh, we understand she is temporarily disabled. She's at Alcor, safe and secure, and at some point we look forward to seeing her again in the future. And uh, that, so that was a, an announcement to some people I, I thought should know about today. It's a real situation. Uh, 
I'm signed up as, as my wife and my children. Uh, it would be very hard for me to take someone I cared for and put them into a ground or a crematory. That would just, it would go against everything that I believe is going to happen in the future, which is physical immortality. So, Bill, thank you for the update on what's going on with the time ship. I'd like to point out that we do have the time ship architect book in our library in the reference section. Also, you mentioned the New Science uh, magazine. We've got that, in, I think, in the window over there next to the library. So thanks for bringing that up. I've seen some things tonight that I haven't seen before, some news to me. I don't get some of those papers that you can only get in New York City. So I'll have to uh, check some of these things out online more closely, perhaps. So we mentioned last month a little something about the RADFest. Rudy brought it up. And uh, how many people do not know what the RADFest is or what it's about? Only 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, more, came, more people being honest, 12, 13, 14, great. You know, the RADFest, RAD stands for R-A-A-D, R-A-A-D, the Revolution Against Aging and Death. It was the largest meeting of people that are interested in unlimited lifespans ever in the history of this planet. How many people were at the RADFest last year? RADFest 2017, 16 rather, 2016. So the rest of you can go to RADFest 2017 and not want to miss it, I'm sure. RADFest 2017 is coming up. Last year we had nearly a thousand people. This year they're shooting for double that. And it's going to be fantastic. It's going to be wonderful. It's going to be amazing. And Doug, I'm ready for you. I'd like to bring up at this moment a uh, gentleman uh, who heads our AV to tell you a little bit about RADFest 2017. Our own AV wizard, Mr. Doug Baldwin. Douglas. Good evening. It's good to see you all here, and especially our teens and 20s friends back again this year. <clears throat> Can you hit that, Warren? Great, thanks. Um, this is, uh, we call it RADFest Rapid. This is from last year's DVDs, which are available for sale from the <coughs> RADFest website. And we apologize in advance to those people who don't like their edit. Some people just appear and then disappear because we don't have time to show their entire presentation. The DVDs are a, six, a set of six DVDs, so it's really rather extensive, and we do encourage you to consider getting that. <clears throat> the Coalition for Radical Life Extension uh, puts on RADFest, and they're also a uh, part of People Unlimited out of uh, Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, the videos are either $100 for the full set of six physical DVDs, or they have an online option. $85 for streaming online in HD. was their quickie version of the DVDs. Ours is going to be just a little longer. This is their brand new logo they just came out with. It's a little more intricate than their previous one. They've got some DNA in the back there. And the eyes are uh, clocks, which is maybe a little hard for you to see. So it's uh, August 9th through August 13th in San Diego. And they're going to have uh, world-class um, speakers. Uh, Bill Falloon is a speaker. Neil is going to be a speaker. Suzanne Summers is going to be there again. She's always entertaining and interesting. The um, <coughs> advantages, well, we'll just move along. 
uh, San Diego. It's at the Town and Country uh, Resort, and it includes uh, live entertainment, uh, five healthy meals or sit-down meals that are uh, prepared and served, and uh, there's a Saturday night party, and there's an exhibitor space for uh, an expo. Hi, I'm Jim Stroh, director for the Coalition for Radical Life Extension. I first want to thank all of you that were at RadFest last year in San Diego in August, and I want to invite you back. It's important for us all to be there again together, bring our family and friends, everybody else is interested in Radical Life Extension or just Life Extension, and be together and create the momentum that we want to create to impact this world. Be there at RadFest. We're going to do something great together. I'm excited to see you all again and meet new people. We're going to have a magnificent time. We're going to have the best of age reversal science. We're going to have fun doing it. We're going to have entertainment, parties, a celebration of life, and we're going to spread this throughout the world. I'm looking forward to seeing you there. There's a Bill and Suzanne again. The uh, current pricing is uh, $6.92. There's a student pricing and discounts if two people register at once. Uh, the price goes up, I guess, June 12th. There's a discount code if you are signing up. You can put in perpetual for perpetual life and that'll drop the cost by 50 bucks. And now we're going to have the, <clears throat> this is, uh, last month we had DVDs one, two, and three. This is what's cut down out of the final uh, DVDs four, five, and six. Thank you. Music is life, and we have more music. Please welcome Berkeley Brown. accomplished performer and composer. You saw her here perform yesterday, and she's also Global Outreach Coordinator for the SENS Research Foundation. Please welcome Maria Antragas Abramson. I'm alive! <laughs> I'm alive! <laughs> anyway, hello everybody. I'm um, really, really excited to be at this event. It really is a dream come true to be here. I've been thinking about Radical Life Extension since I was a little girl. I grew up in Argentina. I'm also a Latin American, like Jose says, revolucionaria. So, viva la revolucion! <laughs> Ray Kurzweil said that Max Moore's ideas are very influential among other big thinkers who in turn are influence leaders themselves. Max's writings represent well-grounded science futurism and reflect a sophisticated understanding of technology trends and how these trends are likely to develop during this coming century. Please welcome on, on stage the awesome Dr. Max Moore. Good morning. I got it kind of late. I'm not sure if I'm in the right place. Let me check. Are you alive? Yeah. Do you want to stay alive? Yeah. Are you going to make that happen? Yeah. Okay, I'm in the right room. That's good. When the doctor gives up, 
say, screw you, I'm not dead yet, just like a Monty Python. I'm not dead yet. I'm just on pause. It's just like you're in a coma for a while. You're going to come back, you're going to keep living, and you're going to keep living for as long as you want. So my message is, don't forget that seatbelt as you drive through life. Thank you. These times that we're living in are so interesting. Science fiction meets science. Natasha Vidamore, she wrote the Transhumanist Manifesto in 1983 that has since grown to be the largest worldwide culture for radical life extension and the ethical use of technology. There's been so much play on zero patient, zero this, zero that. And I believe that we're all at ground zero in defining who we are and how we're going to live longer and basically stay alive. Others that I learned from and I want to pass it on and I think everyone should give credit to the people who came before them because no one did it on their own and we as a group can build the next sphere. Thank you. Well, I'm uh, so honored to be sitting between this power couple. Wonderful, thank you so much. That was amazing, thank illuminating, you, like always. Incredible. Thank you, everybody. Good to be here. Stay here for more. Thank you, everybody. Bye bye. Like some of you, I've heard some of these speakers before, and I, I feel like we're hearing them at their best here. I feel like they're really giving their best here. I appreciate that. Part of our project here with the coalition and with RadFest is to create a home field advantage for our radical life extension leaders, where they actually have the opportunity to uh, articulate this paradigm to an audience that is really actually in favor of the paradigm. Our next moderator, she is director of the Chase Life Extension Foundation, involved with distribution, brand management, and formulation of anti-aging products Please ra welcome Rachel Degar. Hello, everyone. Hey. Oh, good. You can understand me. It is a total honor to be invited halfway across the world to come here and to be with you today. And I can tell you, thank you, <laughs> another Kiwi. Um, I can tell you that the energy in this room is going to be taken back with me across the globe when I go back. So I thank you all for that. This is an incredible group of people. Dr. Courtright offers new research and advice on enhancing cognitive abilities and how to protect ourselves from cognitive decline. Here to share those insights, please welcome Dr. Brant Courtright. Hi, everybody. I would like to talk to you today about the most important thing in the world. your brain. Thank you. Our next speaker, Steve Perry, is active, really active as you'll hear, in the field of emerging life extension sciences. So much so that in 2014, he bravely made himself patient zero by taking GDF 11. Now, he believes this naturally occurring peptide is one of the main components in the aging program. Please welcome to the stage Steve Perry. How many of you have heard of uh, GDF 11? Not enough. Okay, well, you're going to hear a lot about it in the next few years. This is the uh, uh, diagram with a GDF 11 molecule. Beautiful. It's a uh, 45,000 Daltons. It's a huge molecule. It's the biggest cytokine, the biggest signaling molecule in the human body. You know, All right, you I finish. Again. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Okay, and so the next person we're going to hear from, Dr. Kamala, is a world renowned expert in regenerative medicine, and she focuses her skills on adipose derived well. stem cells. And we're going to hear from her about advancements in regenerative medicine. Please welcome Dr. Krista Kamellan. Thank you. Appreciate being here at the RAD conference. And uh, I'd like to tell you that when I first began presenting about stem cells, it was around the year 2000. And it was at a small conference, and uh, it was just a side topic about stem cells. 
and they said, yes, we'll, we'll let you present, and they put us in a side closet room, and I think 10 people maybe had wandered into the room by accident. Uh, so now it's wonderful to see thousands of people hearing about stem cells and understanding that these are going to change uh, how we live and how we uh, advance our future in medicine. Thank you again for your time. Well, isn't her passion just inspiring? Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from another beautiful Kristen. Don't be confused. It's Kristen, Dr. Kristen Willemere. Now, she's a clinical neuroscientist with a particular interest in neurophysiology, neurogenetics, and neurodegenerative diseases. Please welcome to the stage Dr. Kristen Willemere. Wow, what an honor and a pleasure to be here with you today. And can I just say, viva la revolution? And just a sincere debt of gratitude to all of the wonderful people who did this work with me. Thank you. Thank you. The next person that we'll hear from is Dr. Gordon, and he's been a strong advocate of integrative and functional medicine. To share his work on trauma and underlying hormone decline, Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Mark Gordon. How's everybody doing? Great. Okay, since I have a three hour lecture in 13 and a half minutes, let's go. Well, with that said, I'm still looking for the proverbial Prozac land, which gets a lot of attention, but to this day has never been found. Thank you very much. The next speaker, Dr. Terry Grossman, is the founder of the Grossman Wellness Center. He's a published author and a coach for many who aim to live a longer and healthier life. Please welcome to the stage, Dr. Terry Grossman. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, and viva la revolution. <laughs> Let's do the testing that's part of the LSD program. Let's fully embrace this revolution against aging and death. And I want to thank you very much for your attention. Cool. Great. So we have so many uh, people on this panel who are experts in brain health. On behalf of everyone here, I'd like to thank this incredible panel for sharing all of your insights with us. We have a performance by Charlie Cam. Hello, everybody, and um, I hope you all had a great lunch. I've been involved in the life extension community for a long, long time. And in 2007, I held a conference called Transvision 2007. And it was basically very similar to this. It was a three-day conference in Chicago. So I wrote a song, and I, I sang it. It's called uh, Radical Life Extension. The star is actually a granddaughter of one of the speakers here. Her, her name is Camelia Summers, if that's a hint. So uh, her grandmother is Suzanne Summers, but she was great in this. Doesn't matter how old we might be now, pretty soon we'll all know exactly how. from New Zealand. He's a singer and songwriter. Let's all give a big round of applause for Chris Sanders. Thank you very much. It's nice to be in San Diego. Thanks for having me. This is my first gig in America. And the song is called I Want to Live Forever. Want to live forever 
together eternity will make <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Our first speaker, Dr. Moss Jackson, and he's here to uh, give us a glimpse of what that means to design a psychology of immortality. Welcome, Dr. Jackson. The psychology of immortality. I mean, how ridiculous is that? I don't have any patients who've been living for 200, 500, 1,000 years, but I'm open for referrals. I'm open for referrals. So I'm declaring I'm the first psychologist of immortality. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Michael Grieve, please give a warm welcome to Michael. Hello, everybody. We are living in exciting times. Thank you, and may you all live long and prosper. Dr. Ruby, uh, Steve Ruby, is a doctor of chiropractic. Thank you. Revolution. Yes. I want to take this guy with me everywhere I go, like to work. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Lori Handlers. Thank you. Hi, everybody. So my topic is sex. Woohoo! So I was set up yesterday really well by Suzanne Summers because she talked about it a little bit. She gave you a little introduction to what was happening in her sex life, which was really cool. I was very happy about that. And the thing is, I only have 10 minutes, so this is going to be like speed dating, only it's speed sex. Thank you so much. It's been my pleasure to talk about pleasure. Dr. Kirk Parsley is a uh, sleep and health optimization expert. All right. I usually like to start with a little more foreplay, but that's all I have. Thank you. Peter Nygaard, a world-renowned uh, designer. Welcome, Peter Nygaard. Thank you very much. Since I started this six years ago, I've been to about 40 different conferences. I must say I have nothing ever, ever had something as beneficial as this. And this is truly what really feels like home, really feels like family. Somebody mentioned that. I just love it. I think about 10 different things right now, you know, that I can hardly wait to tell you about in our next meeting. So enjoy. Our next speaker is Steve Matlin. So I'm Steve Matlin. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here with you all from Madrid, Spain, where our home company is headquartered. I'm the CEO of LifeLink, the world-leading diagnostic laboratory for telomere testing and measurement. Thank you so much for your interest and attention. Uh, first question I have, if you're going to live to 500 years, what would you like to master? Thank you to all our panelists. I'm to be moderating this panel, Otto Siegel. Good afternoon. It is Joe Polly. And there's some very bright people in this room, which is kind of cool. Thank you. So our next panel member is Kevin Brown. As Bernadine's son, Kevin was literally born into an environment of biological immortality. My title, well, I don't have any uh, super special anything uh, degree, whatever that is. Um, I don't have it. Uh, so I just kind of call myself like the groove doctor and the beat surgeon. Music is healing. Music is healing. The vibration of music we all need. It's been with us since the beginning of time. I would love to talk for another hour on that because I could, but I won't. Thank you. Maria is also a science and technology communicator, especially in her role at the, with the Sense Foundation. Here is Maria Andregas. Hello, Rasters. How are you? Are you having a good time? Thank you for having me. Thank you, Aubrey, Sense, everybody. Thank you. Joe Bardeen. He is an award-winning writer with two 20 years of experience. Here is Joe Bardeen. Hi. Yeah. The hardcore revolutionaries are still in the room. I salute you. It's the best idea ever. Be loud, be proud. If you haven't already, sign up for the coalition. Thank you. 
to introduce the director of the Coalition for Radical Life Extension and co-founder and co-director of People Unlimited to you. Ladies and gentlemen, here is James Stroll. Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you guys. Wow, thank you all, all of you guys in this panel together and everybody has so contributed to this. I'm not gonna waver. How many are not gonna waver with each other here? How many are not gonna waver? Thank you very much. She's co-founder and co-director of People Unlimited and the Coalition of Radical Life Extension. Bernadine has spoken and written about physical mortality for over four decades. Please help me welcome Bernadine. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Well, you know what? I decided I'm not dying to keep uh, overpopulation from happening. <laughs> you know, I think we'll figure it all out. Stay alive. Stay alive so we, can, so we can do what we really need to do here. That's what I feel. It's never too late to turn it around, but you have to move. It takes movement. If you don't move the body, the body stops moving. So it's really vital to keep moving. Thank you. <laughs> so, one question for Joe Polish. That is, what advice can you give someone who's battling food addiction? And that is a great note to end this conversation. Thank you, panel members. Thank you all for you. contributing today. I want to bring on a very special guy that I've really enjoyed hearing him sing and his participation. Uh, you heard him sing one other song. Now he's got a song about the coalition. He's going to sing Chris Sanders. Hello again. Hey, How are you going? This is now my second concert in the USA. You should listen to music and use it to inspire you. And, you know, people from all different walks of life can listen to music and, uh, you know, really enjoy it. So this song is called Seven Billion People Unlimited. People without limits. People unlimited. 7,000 million reasons to be, to believe, to believe, oh, to believe. Some very important people, some revolutionists, Woo! who have some things they want to say. How is everybody today? Wow, wow. I, I, I'm so glad so many of you were able to uh, stay for this last event because it's going to be really powerful. Uh, we have two panels, you know, Lana and Molly talking about uh, the movement of the body, which is very, really great, a an ageless movement. And then the whole steering committee is going to come up on stage and we're going to totally interact with you guys. A really great time. I think I danced about 11.30 last night, something like that. It was, a, it was really a great, great dance, great party. Thank, thank all of you. Uh, thank uh, Living Proof for their... Uh, performance that was awesome the band and then you heard David Shelton sing first but where's David A somewhere this guy has an amazing voice there he is he's been here over 80 years on this planet and still has, it just sings beautifully he's a good example that you can keep on moving and going thank you David and then we had the international DJ Kevin Brown which has always puts on a good DJ performance for us thank you Kevin yeah I really had a lot of fun at the party last night I think I dance more than I have in a while. I had a blast. It was, it was great. Nothing like having a lot of fun in the midst of everything that's going on. Great age reversal science, really intense things, and having a lot of fun at the same time. It's a great mix. A great mix. That's what Radfest is about, and we're going to keep that momentum going. Thank you so much. That was beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> Aren't they great? How many of you actually move your body at least once a week? <laughs> Keep your hands raised if you think you could do just a little bit more. She has been in the fitness and health industry for over 30 years, and she is the owner of a gym in Scottsdale, Arizona called Energy Fitness. Her name is Ilana Art, and she is going to share her knowledge with you. <laughs> excited to be here. I feel so privileged and joyful to be able to speak to all of you. 
There's something about experiencing the joy of taking care of our bodies. Wow, I'm here for all these years and I'm getting better all the time. So you have to move their, your body. Because no matter what scientific enhancements come out, and they're coming out, they're on their way, you want to be prepared physically to be able to take them into your body. You have to have a healthy, fit, moving body to even be able to, to, to um, benefit from all those uh, great enhancements that are coming your way. When it comes to exercise, I feel aging is lack of movement. It's never too late. You're breathing, you're alive, and now you're more excited than ever because you know you have people you can do it with. So definitely start moving now. No procrastination, you guys. Stop it. Stop procrastinating. Move now. Okay, everybody get up. Get up. Get up. Move now. Move now. Now is the moment, right? Not tomorrow, not today. Pick your arms up. Feel your body. Yeah. No pain, all gain. Okay, you may sit down, but you can also stand up. Do as little sitting down as possible. Avoid injury. Resistance training for me is definitely the number one. And this is what I find training people in all ages. If I can keep the muscle on their body, I'm doing something really good for them when it comes to their lifestyle in the future. We heard some information here about cardio for the brain. Absolutely, do not do cardio to lose weight. Don't do it. It doesn't work. You have to lose weight. You need to eat correctly. So cardio is for the cardiovascular system. Thank you. This panel that we're going to talk about is about transforming your body at any age. And then they get up on the days that they don't want to and they move their bodies. They order things on the menu that maybe they wish they could order differently, but they do it because they're honoring their body as a temple. You are a physical body in motion. Molly Sheridan. Good morning. Good morning. Am I on? You guys hear me okay? Okay, good. What is an ultra marathon? What the heck is that? An ultra marathon is any distance that you run that's over the marathon distance of 26.2 miles. Wait, don't tell people, they can't do, especially don't tell a group of these kind of people that we can't do something because we're gonna live forever now. I finished the marathon, I sent the, my marathon results to that doctor and said, please don't tell people that they can't do what they wanna do and have goals. Because it raised the level of my consciousness, I thought better, I felt clearer, I felt energize in my life with exercise and movement and if I'm talking about running and you can't relate that's okay swim bike hike you know move to a martial arts class do yoga Pilates anything that moves your body my mode of transportation is running I just happen to love it I found the fun we just need to get out there and move and have fun and lift the human spirit with movement it's huge so with that I will let you go thank you so much uh, Ilana you answered this a little bit, but maybe there's something you want to expand on. Thank you, lady. OK, thank you. So we're heading into our interactive forum with the steering committee. It's uh, creating a culture and a marketplace. We're actually creating a new supply and de demand dynamic for our revolution. And so uh, we really appreciate our sponsors, our founding sponsors, our People Unlimited and Life Extension Foundation. This is the steering committee for the coalition. Dr. Aubrey de Grey, Bernadine, Dr. Bill Andrews, Bill Falloon, David Keckett, Jim Stroll, Dr. Jose Cordero, Liz Parrish, Dr. Moore, Dr. Vita Moore, Neil Vandery. What you're taking away from RadFest? We'll start with Aubrey. I've been to a lot of conferences over the years, and it's extremely unusual for such a high proportion of the delegates to be so dedicated and come to every session right through to the end of the conference. Very unusual. So I want to congratulate all of you. It's been astonishingly successful. I, I, I've, got to t I've got to say that when Jim first told me about this meeting, I really didn't think he was going to pull it off. Thank you for being here. Thank yourselves for coming and participating with us. Jose, I didn't know you were so much fun before. This truly is launching, right now, a biomedical renaissance. More energized even now. That's, that's what I think we do for one another. Uh, I'm a big believer in reciprocation of life. Buenos dias! Viva la revolución! 
future is getting better and better. We are going to change uh, humanity. We are going to change humans. What I've really enjoyed about this conference, more than almost any really, is that it's put the fun in forever. We need to have fun. This is why this is a festival. We're going to have fun. We're going to have fun forever. No more kicking to the curb of cemeteries, people who are has been. And it would have fallen on empty years without your participation. So I'm so glad you came. Thank you, and thank you to all the volunteers. We start standing up for the 100,000 lives that we're going to lose today and every day until we do something about it. Stay in touch with all the people who are positive with this movement. You have to stay in touch with those people, otherwise other people who are pro-death and, and don't get it could dumb you down and just, it takes away your joy, doesn't it? This common ground of our revolution really does unite us. A common strand of, of, of passion. Our timing here is perfect. We're right on time. So we, not, we don't need to be apathetic about it. We don't need to let this energy at all waste away. Let's build on it. Thank you to the steering committee. You've been fantastic. Revolution! Air hug. Hi, I'm Jim Stroh, director for the Coalition for Radical Life Extension. I first want to thank all of you that were at RadFest last year in San Diego in August, and I want to invite you back. It's important for us all to be there again together, bring our family and friends, everybody else is interested in radical life extension or just life extension, and be together and create the momentum that we want to create to impact this world. Be there at RadFest. We're going to do something great together. I'm excited to see you all again and meet new people. We're going to have a magnificent time. We're going to have the best of age reversal science. We're going to have fun doing it. We're going to have entertainment, parties, a celebration of life, and we're going to spread this throughout the world. I'm looking forward to seeing you there. Great job. All right, okay. Doug, 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 great job on that, uh, putting that together. What he did was put together multiple days of a conference and all of the things that you saw in snippets in order to be able to show you in a short period of time a little bit about what happened in San Diego last year. And it's coming back around this year. And it's going to be greater. It's going to be even better. This could be a life-changing moment for you. If you can get to the RadFest 2017, it could be revolutionary in your life. It could help you to live a long and long time. So I, I heavily suggest that you get signed up for the RadFest. I, I can't uh, express how important it could be for you. It was amazing for me. It was, it's, it's not like any other science conference that you, if you've ever been to those. It's, it's a festival. It's wonderful. You have the opportunity tonight, if you haven't signed up yet for RadFest, you can sign up tonight. Warren will be here. He can sign you up on our computer. He'll, he can take care of that for you. Warren, are you going to be back by the library? I get a yes. So he's got a computer. Yes? Great. Perfect, perfect stuff, Warren. So he's going to be here with a mobile computer wandering around. If you'd like to sign up, he'll be here to help you to do that if you have not yet signed up. And there's a certain word. I think you can use perpetual as the code, Warren, and you can use perpetual to save, I think, $50 or something. So be sure everybody gets to enjoy that savings as well. All right. So we had Rudy and we had Bill. We had Doug's famous videos. I want to thank all of you for being here. We have a five-star chef downstairs preparing a meal for you of chicken or salmon or vegan options. So I can, I can smell the food up here. It's, it's wonderful. So now you have a chance to enjoy a little bit of uh, food and drink and merriment and uh, have a chance to also discuss things directly with Rudy and Bill, myself, and Doug and the others. Thanks for coming to Perpetual Life, and we'll see you again next month. <laughs>